Hello everyone, we have another great episode here for you. Today we're talking about sumo wrestling, Britney Spears, and the thing you must do with every single commit. We have a great interview with Nate Bidding, the architect of the best practices assessment tool, and we play malware trivia with none other than Tacoma Bob. How well do you know your malware? And Mitch and I compare our firewalls to see whose firewall is the most secure. You do not want to miss this episode. We're having a great time drinking to putting your best firewall forwards with a BPA. Cheers. Cheers. It's that time again. It's Learning Happy Hour with Mitch and Jason. BYOB and bring your own brain. Cheers. So we're back. Another episode. Mitch and Jason show. Ah, learning happy hour. Um, hey, I wanted to show something to you. Yeah, in fact, actually. Oh, yeah. So I don't know if you can see this very well. Yeah. But uh, this cup says Jason and it says see that. learning happy hour. Where did you get that? I need one of those. That is <laughs> I know, awesome. I know. My, uh, my son uh, got this for me for Christmas. So, so we had it made or something? Yeah, Amazon. You just go to Amazon and they will do they do that on etching on the glass. Yeah. Oh, so. the ideas runneth over. I could think of so many things that I now want etched because Amazon can do it. That's awesome. Yeah, Amazon can do anything. <laughs> Hey, we want to uh, we want to start things off with here, Mitch, and say thank you to a couple of people. Cheers, maybe. Cheers, yeah. Cheers, cheers. to a couple of people. We want to especially say uh, thank you to the live community um, for. Oh, you know, I, I, yes. I mean, the live folks have been a phenomenal support for us. Uh, you guys find us on live community, and if you're watching us on YouTube, go over to the live community. That's where we've got a whole bunch more resources. Uh, it's the best place to go ask questions, get answers, and find really awesome in-depth information. So if you're not familiar with live.paloaltonetworks.com, today is today. Go check it out because there's so much there. I, I tell my classes that the live community is the oracle of all knowledge that is good and holy because if I've ever had a question that I could not answer myself, I found an answer in the live community. It's that. <laughs> That is so well said. <laughs> All right. And the other people we want to say thank you to is the education group at uh, Palo Alto Networks. So uh, Mitch and I both work for the education um, department, which we call Global Enablement. And there's a lot of people uh, who are creating the courseware, um, who are doing training for customers and for partners, creating content. And we have this thing known as the Learning Center, and it's free. So everybody and anybody can participate. You create an account, you register. If you take a class, you can, you know, that's typically part of the process is registering and signing up for uh, the LMS. But when you're in the LMS or the Learning Center, you have access to your course transcript. You can print out a certificate of completion if you've taken a course but you also have access to free training. There's a PCNSE series in there that um, both Mitch and I created videos for, but there are other people who have also contrib uh, contributed to that. And there's a ton of other training done by a lot of other people. There's new classes on the logging service, on magnifier, on the firewall. You just do a search for like EDU, for example, and that will bring up a lot of free resources and free training for you. So a lot of great resources there for you. And Mitch and I wouldn't be doing this if it weren't for a global enablement. So big thank you to you folks. Yeah, I want to echo that. You know, the Palace Networks education team, obviously, <clears throat> they're effing awesome. We would not be here and we would not stay here if they weren't so spectacular, not only as peers, as leadership, um, but as supporters. So, as we mentioned earlier, we're drinking today to the best practice assessment tool and putting the best firewall forward. So, let's dig into that. I know we've got a great interview. Mitch, you did a great interview uh, with Nate Bidding. But before we get to that, let's talk a little bit about what the BPA is. So, the BPA is the best practice assessment tool. And I only learned that recently. But it's a way to compare your firewall's configuration, effectively a posture, against the vendor best practices. 
And a lot of customers ask, you know, what are your best practices? And, and you get handed a big ass document, but that's too tough to compare, you know, this document versus how we actually operate. The BPA compares exactly how you operate to all of the Palo Alto Network's threat researchers' best practices. <laughs> The uh, hotel Wi-Fi you're on <clears throat> makes you slur your speech a little bit. It's almost like you've been drinking I have. a lot more than you oh. have. <laughs> <laughs> Why are we doing an episode on the BPA? As you guys are going to see in the interview, Nate gives you some really neat ideas as to how the BPA could be used. But I want to focus in on one key point he makes. Without a check, a health check, a way of metering yourself or, or validating that your efforts are or are not going to be fruitful, you're guessing. I mean, yeah. I could tell you, or you could go watch a YouTube video that someone says, hey, you should really use App Override. And you might think, oh, App Override's a great thing. I'm going to use App Override everywhere. Well, that's the wrong thing. <laughs> you should stay far from App Override as possible because that's letting or telling the firewall, let some traffic go through without inspecting it, or at least without detecting what the real app ID is. And so you're telling the firewall to do one of these things to a degree to a certain type of traffic and the potential for abuse is high. And so you could work off of a bad suggestion or a bad example. And really the best practice assessment tool is a vetted, industry validated way of, of showing you exactly where you rank against the vendor recommendation. So final question, Mitch, how does a customer get into the BPA? That's the easiest answer, Jason. You go to support.paloaltonetworks.com. Under the tools section, you'll find the best practice assessment tool. You take a, uh, it's a tarball. It's the tech support dump file. You can generate it under the device tab support within your PanOS firewall export that, import it into the customer support portal, and then it gives you back that HTML report. Great. Now, Mitch, you and I decided we would do a little bit of a comparison, a little contest between each other, and we thought we would use the BPA to grade each other's firewalls. So the question now is, whose firewall most adheres to the best practices of Palo Alto Networks. So before I show you the comparison between Mitch's firewall and my firewall, I want to mention that we've got a lot of great resources around how to use the BPA, uh, how to um, run it, how to understand it and information about the prevention architecture. So I wanna encourage you to check out those resources. In fact, Scott Johansson did this great video around um, demonstrating the BPA, and I'm not gonna recreate that here, but I do wanna show you a couple of things um, as we compare our firewalls. This is one of our reports. What you see here on the screen is, you see a summary of my adoption. So you can see that I've got 100% adoption of wildfire on my rules. Under high technology average, on average, about 36% actually uses wildfire on the rules. So I'm, I'm you know, well over 60 plus percent, the average customer in my technology area or my industry area that actually applies wildfire. So that's, that's yeah. good. And you get to compare yourself when you run the tool against industries like uh, education, um, high technology, you've got industrial control. So really it's, it's a nice way to, to measure yourself. And for you guys watching, this is a great way to kind of say, look boss, we're doing good. And I'm, I'm taking this um, it, it, from a positive outlook because it just goes downhill from here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <clears throat> So one of the things you can see here is you can get this summary view, which is visual. It's a temperature kind of approach. So the green is good, red is bad, or less, I should say. If I scroll down, you can see that my app ID adoption is about 65%, and then mm -hmm. user ID adoption is zero. So on my current firewall here at home, 
I'm not using user ID. Then if I scroll down, you can see that I'm logging most everywhere, but there is no log forwarding. I don't have any zone protection profiles. What the heck, man? I know. Tell me about it. Come on. And then down below, it shows me that I'm not doing any decryption either. Oh, Jason, my friend. So <laughs> much traffic to the internet is encrypted nowadays thanks to Google and Let's Encrypt. If you're not decrypting, you're blind, deaf, and dumb. To all the threats out there. That's right. Emphasis on... Um, on those the dom. Yeah, <laughs> so now if um, I want to, one of the things that I can do with the best practice assessment tools, I can dig into this further. So there's some really useful features with this and that in addition to this visual report that I have, I also get this spreadsheet. So let me share with you my spreadsheet here. And we're going to look at Mitch's here in a minute, but you can see with the spreadsheet, it tells me, um, where I'm failing. So it itemizes for me my failed check <laughs> and it makes recommendations for remediation. And notice I've got 57 failed checks with my security policy rules. Um, and then I've got... I, I'm sorry, Can I? if I can interrupt for just one second. Yeah, go ahead. I think it's fantastic that you can get an itemized report of your failures. Uh, that just sounds amazing. And <laughs> my parents wish... They would have got one of these in their inbox every week about their children. Uh, that's just so they cool. They could get ahead and remediate, right? <laughs> right. right. Pa parents would love a tool like this to run on their kids. Absolutely. So if I click on policies, then I can dig even further on a policy by policy basis. So here is the list of my policies. Like I've got one called block apps. So there's a set of apps that I'm blocking. And then you'll notice that um, this particular remediation is log forwarding. So when I click on it, and it clicked over for me even before I realized it there, I clicked a little too fast. That's okay. See that it tells me here's log forwarding, and here's why I brought you in here. I know there's a lot of text on the screen, so if you're trying to read this, it's going to be really difficult. The main point I want to, to, to just introduce you here is the fact that there is an explanation included with the BPA. It doesn't just show you a percentage. Like Mitch uh, said earlier, when we were talking about the why, there's the why is attached to this. Why should I create a, a log forwarding profile for this rule? And so there's rationale. Then if I scroll to the right, there's even uh, references. So I can dig further uh, into it uh, by referring to the official documentation. Now let's go back to the heat map for a moment. One more thing. In this short amount of time, we've just kind of done an overview, but there's a lot more to it. If I click on, for instance, go to best practice assessment, I can go into greater detail on each one of the areas of my firewall. So I can look at how my device configuration is scored, how my policies are scored. One I think is really interesting is you can get into details around your security profile. So you can see with my antivirus that I've passed several of the recommendations, but I'm failing this recommend, uh, recommendation down here because I don't have packet capture enabled. So there's much more to the best practice assessment tool, and I encourage you to go over to that Prevention Architecture website to learn more. I'll include a link to that in our show notes. What I want to do now, though, is let's look at Mitch's. You ready? Uh, I'm scared. Well, while you pull this up, I, I do want to kind of highlight one thing. Our corporate motto is to protect our way of life in the digital age by preventing successful cyber attacks. So we take your success serious as a heart attack. And that's why these tools exist. And that's why they're free. And that's why they don't just give you a score and walk away. They lead you towards a better state. So here is Mitch's BPA assessment. And as you can see, he's 92% with the wildfire. Not quite 100% like me. <laughs> you know why? Intrazone default. I realized this after I submitted the file to you is there are some default rules that I have not yet turned on security profiles for, which I really should. I don't have uh, security profiles for intrazone default. And were you 100% on them? Yeah. 
And there must be another rule I don't have it turned off for. Ah, <laughs> uh, you know what? Hang on. All right. I, I can explain this. <laughs> no, you don't have to. Let's keep going. No. All right. Well, fair enough. So if I scroll down, I can see that one of the things that you have is you have 0% on credential phishing, but you have data filtering enabled, and that's something I'm not doing. So you actually have data filtering enabled. So what are you, what are you using data filtering for? So file blocking. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm looking for credit cards. So that's traditional data filtering. Uh, and then I'm doing file blocking, which is similar, right? And they're two separate entries, but right. uh, they both feed into the same log. But mainly on the data filtering, I'm focused on uh, credit card numbers being submitted because heaven forbid it, I get a key logger and then they try, you know, they capture credit card information over a period of months and then they submit it all out in a single session. So I've got several, most of my internet facing rules have data filtering enabled on them as okay. well as file blocking. So you've got user ID adoption. <clears throat> somewhat. Yep, somewhat, a little bit there. Um, I'm a little bit higher on the app ID adoption, but you're pretty good everywhere else. And then the other big one that you have is you have log forwarding adoption. So you're doing log forwarding 100% and you have decryption enabled. So these are two big um, things that I think you're, you're definitely outscoring me in the BPA grade. I think this is a good time for us to transition into the interview that you did with Nate. Before we jump into that, let me ask you, what was the biggest takeaway from this interview for you? Actually, don't, don't answer that. Let me ask you that after we show the interview. Fair enough. Roll tape. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. Tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do here at Public Now. Okay. Um, yeah. So um, I've been with the company uh, three years as of January 4th. Nice. So, yeah. So just came, uh, my anniversary just came around. So my role is uh, I'm the director of customer experience automation. Good and so uh, what we do is we really look at not just, I mean, firewall is our primary focus because that's the bulk of what we do, yep. um, but we're, we're slowly starting to extend out to all the other products as well. Oh, cool. uh, we built some health check tools for traps that the professional services team uses and some of our partners use, um, really just to understand you know, how customers are deploying like our ESMs and things like that. But now that things are moving to the cloud, we now have to look at TMS and what does that look like? And, you know, and we have a lot of SaaS products now. So there's a lot of data that we have to work on and them. we haven't really tapped into it yet. Um, so that's kind of where things are going uh, down the road. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so I probably gave you a lot. No, there, no, that's. But... I really appreciate that. That's yeah, great. Yeah. Um, a lot of things that I can I can follow there. Mm -hmm. um, so that actually explains a lot about one of my first questions: How did the customer success team and the BPA come about? Thank you for that. Um, mm -hmm. What is the primary value that you expect customers to to glean from using the BPA? Um, yeah. So well, before I answer that, yeah. I will talk a little bit more about how the BPA came about, because yeah, I didn't really answer that yet. Okay. Um, and so when I when we first um, started looking into this, we were working with maybe three or four of our bigger accounts here in the Bay Area, mm. and we just wanted to understand, hey, what are you using? What are you not using? And um, we really didn't know how we were going to go about it yet. And so we said, well, so I, I literally started walking the halls. I didn't know anybody in the company. Here. And, yes, <laughs> uh, at the old building. Okay, yeah. And um, I just found some engineers with some code up on their screen and I said, hi, I'm Nate. Um, this is what I'm trying to do. What do you recommend? And they said, oh yeah, like, well, you should use the configuration. And I said, okay. And I've never dealt with XML in my, in my life. So I started figuring out like, okay, what, what would be useful? And so what we, what the biggest challenge was adoption, right? Adoption was the biggest challenge, like app ID, user yeah. ID, um, so feature adoption. Feature adoption. And and so I said, okay, let's start there. And how would we measure that? Like, you know, I'm an operations person, and so I'm just thinking metrics, KPIs. And so that that's I'm a data guy, right? Okay. That's my background. So I have a machine learning background and and um, analytics and BI. And so that I just think that way. I'm just a data person. I was like, oh, this is just data. And but how do you visualize it to make it actionable and meaningful? And so we first started out and we came up with the um, a text report. The very first version was literally parsing the XML and just generating statistics, right? What percentage of your rules are using app ID, user ID, et cetera? Um, and that was useful. And we shared it with a couple customers. They're like, yeah, this is, this is a step in the right direction. And then I, um, one day I just exported some data to Excel, built a pivot table, and put some conditional formatting. And that's how the heat map came out. 
Oh man, I bet the people just. And then, and when I and I was like, "What do you guys think of this?" And they were like, "This is amazing." And <laughs> and I was like, "Okay, cool." And then we just started iterating. They wanted different slices and dices of that same data. Um, a guy that I worked with a long time, I went to grad school with. Um, I uh, had him join the company, and I said, "Look, we we need to take this from Excel. This is more mom and pop shop. We need to make it a little bit more polished." Um, but it couldn't be like a PDF report. Like it had to be filterable and actionable. Interactable. But it had to be offline because yeah. people want to email a file around or they want a deliverable. And so that's why we made an HTML report. Oh, I like that. Yeah. And so all the JavaScript, everything's embedded in one file. Yeah. Um, and that's how the heat map came out. And we had the heat map out for about six months or so. Um, it was getting a lot of traction on it. Um, but then there was a really big focus um, from the leadership side on writing best practice guides. Mm. And, you know, I was like, look, there's not a single technology vendor that I've ever worked with in the past where I had time to sit down and read a best practice guide. Usually if I have an issue, I Google it, I find the answer and it'll direct me to their, you know, like our live community or something like that and yeah. a KB article and I'll figure it out. Or in my case, programming Stack Overflow. Um, <laughs> I love that. Approach. Right, and, yeah. and, then, and then I figure it out. And so I was like, just the engineer in me, I was like, I would much rather have a tool that says, here's what I've done, tell me what I did wrong and what I need to do yeah. to fix it. Personalized. And that is, is what the idea for the BPA. So what we did is we, we got agreement from the leadership team to make an investment to have all of our top engineers across the company get together in, in Plano. Yeah. And we literally pulled up a VM and went through every feature of NOS and said, from a prevention perspective, how should a customer configure this? And these are folks who, from professional services, they know what works oh. and what doesn't work in the wild. Yeah. And we wouldn't want to recommend things that would bring down a network, right. obviously, but it, it's very actionable. And, and so we documented that. And then Andrew Mendoza and myself, we just, you know, in about a month, we built a prototype and got it working and, and then just it's kind of taken off from there. Yeah. That's fantastic. So, so uh, to answer your question of what is the primary value, yeah. our primary focus is, um, is to help build confidence in our customers, right? Um, to me, it's like, you know, if, if I'm a CISO, I'm trying to put myself in their shoes and I'm getting asked from the board, hey, how are we protecting the organization? You know, what's our level of risk and et cetera? If I don't have data, I'm like nervous, right? And, and you're guessing. You're guessing, yeah. yeah. And, and to me, like, I, I think most people are want to have confidence that they actually are communicating things the right way. And, you know, the best practice assessment is not meant to just be done once, right? It's, it's almost, it's, yeah, I mean, use it as much as you want, right? And eventually, you know, and I'll, you're going to ask about the future of it later, um, we will have an API available. So, oh. Um, you know, customers, if they want to automate this, anytime there's a commit, they can kick off a BPA. Almost like a check my health or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Or something like that, you know. So, um, or as part of the validation step before a commit? You could do that potentially. So we, we haven't, and, and then we're also working with product management um, on figuring out how do we embed some of these capabilities into the product. That's huge. Um, and that's always been our end goal. And uh, And some of the best practices that we've had has actually, and the data we're getting has influenced, you know, updates and changes to features. Because, the design. Yeah, to design. Nice. Yeah, exactly. And that's been a challenge. Like, product managers don't have visibility to right. how They're customers... They're detached the same. Yeah, exactly. And so how do we know if customers are using things in a certain way? And we want to make it a better experience for our customers, right? And so it, we need that feedback loop. Now, with regards to feedback loop and data, especially customer data, mm -hmm. is any of it sensitive? And how do we keep that private? Yeah, so, um, so the... Tech support files, all the, the configuration that's in it is already sanitized to a degree. So oh. certifi certificates and anything that's sensitive, passwords, usernames. passwords, that's all been omitted already. IP addresses? Uh, IP addresses are there for like source of destination and their policies. Those are all there. Oh, okay. Um, but you, you kind of need that in some cases for troubleshooting purposes. That's a good right? point. Yeah. Uh, and so, and you know, that is there, um, but we don't store that data. Oh. Okay. So IP address, so we do store uh, so the text port file itself, today we don't store it. We actually, when you upload it, we, uh -huh. we parse the data in memory, get the configuration and some system information out of that, and then we discard it immediately. We don't uh -huh. save the TSF at all. Um, and then we generate the BPA report, and it downloads immediately. We don't actually store a copy of the, the BPA report either. 
Yeah. So historical versions of, of BPA runs, I have to keep myself. They're not stored in the customer support portal. Right. So so even in, sell, in, in customer support portal, if they look at their history view, they can only get access to the executive summary. They can actually download the full report because we don't store all the data. That's cool. So we don't even have the data to generate that report for you again. And And you have to understand, like, this is not only the keys to their kingdom, but it's also everything that they've done wrong. Yeah. So if that data got in the wrong hands, That's that would, point. yeah, so we're, we're very conscious of that. Uh, but we do store aggregate, some, some data, right? Because we want to understand, we, we need to do benchmarking. We need to understand, you know, how customers are using certain features and things like that. Like statistics. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you guys have a privacy data sheet for the BPA? Uh, we're actually working on that. We've had, we've had uh, like a privacy FAQ in the past. Mm -hmm. Uh, but you know the company, like a lot of our products, have like actual detailed privacy mm -hmm. that's been reviewed by a third party, um, and so we're we're going through that right now. Primary value is you don't know what you don't know, right? Um, and and it kind of comes down to um, a quote we've used in our organization for a long time from Sun Tzu: "Know the enemy, know yourself. Yeah. You know, in hundred battles, you'll never be defeated. But if you're ignorant of the enemy or of yourself, your chances of winning are 50-50. And so we know a lot about the enemy. But most of our customers and people don't. in this community don't really know about enough about themselves, right? Mm. Um, you know, we have socks, they're looking at a whole bunch of alerts, but it's just like, you don't really know. And so we want to make sure that they're confident that A, that they're configured as they're intended, and that's where the BPA and heat maps come in, and that their environment's operating as intended. And that's where logs and, you know, custom reports and things like that. Um, come What's in. a confidence thing? It's a confidence <clears throat> thing, yeah. Is there any kind of financial benefit they could glean? Um, oh, yeah, definitely. So. Um, some some use cases that we didn't really anticipate was from a, a training standpoint, oh. right? And so we've had several people come to us and say, I actually use the BPA to study for the certification exam. Serious? That's awesome. And it was more useful than some of the materials I was looking through because I could actually test it out. It had the documentation that, that explained why this feature is important. The reference. And so the 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 you know, actually configuring it, getting the feedback, like that was a much better learning experience for them. And so, um, and we've had customers, uh, I had, you know, several EBCs with customers where say so we have a lot of turnover and the people we're trying to hire don't have Palo Alto Networks experience. And this is a really effective tool to just validate that they're actually doing the things they need to do because we don't want to regress, right? right? And so, um, so the value is just, you know, under, you know, making sure you're not making mistakes and you actually have, you know, standards that you can set and it's very simple to run. And now it's available in CSP, so customers can run it directly. CSP? Customer Support Portal. Ah. And we have how-to videos on, on how to do that. So we have a prevention architecture page Ooh. that talks about PPA, BPA, SLR, you know, our overall prevention architecture methodology. And then it also has links to how-to videos and things like that. I was resuming, snooping in on a Slack channel and I saw some uh, a thread that you were a part of regarding insurance. Is there, mm -hmm. what's the linkage between insurance and the BPA? Yeah, so um, uh, so I've been working with cyber insurance community for a while. Um, we had a, an individual senior director uh, who was running all the relationships there. And, and you know, insurance, um, it's all about measuring and assessing risk, right? And right now, the way that they do their underwriting for cyber policies is a detailed questionnaire. Mm. And um, so we've gotten our hands on all of these questionnaires and we've went through a lot of the questions, but the questions, while they're, they're useful, they're all yes, no answers. And if I'm a cyber insurer, I would much rather have tangible data. Um, and so that's where the BPA came in. So once we started aligning the best practice assessment to CIS, critical security controls and NIST and some of these other frameworks, light bulbs go off, they're like, Oh, well, we, this is, you're speaking our same language. They really, they leverage the critical security controls. And so they're like, now for some of these controls, we can then look and see from the inside out how they're actually protecting the organization. So instead of a whole bunch of yes, no questions, we can now look at this. So uh, we're working with a lot of the big players and then also, you know, trying to figure out joint programs between us and those carriers. So if you're a Palo Alto Networks customer, you may get a discount. Um, and then if you use the best practice assessment and you share this data with your carrier on a regular basis or whatever, you might even get further discounts. That's kind of the mm -hmm. idea behind it. Yeah. We haven't really figured out how that's all going to work, um, but we're, we're, we're slowly working through that. So which BPA feature are you most proud of? Um, most proud of? 
Uh, I mean, it's all your baby, but one thing has to have stood out as like, ooh, this is so awesome. Uh, I think, you know, what really was helpful was the executive summaries. Um, because, I, I mean, well, well, there's so many features that are awesome, in, in my opinion. I mean, if you I can talk about all of them. I mean, the heat map is definitely probably the most powerful one. It's I one I go say. to. Um, just because, you know, it, it, it helps under, um, customers understand how they're protecting their environment, not just in one area of their network, but anywhere, right? And so that's where the, um, it's part of when you're creating the BPA, there's an architecture classification process where we want to look at your zones and understanding where you're configuring these zones. And we, we need a, 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 no, a standardized like nomenclature. And so we've defined areas of architecture. So you could say, hey, um, how am I protecting my traffic coming from the perimeter to my data center? Or in, you know, north-south traffic or east-west traffic. Before it was really difficult to do that, but now you can actually use the source and destination area of architecture filters in the, in the, the heat map to actually show you how you're protecting that. Um, so it really starts getting them to think like inside out. So if you say, hey, let's focus on our crown jewels, let's just focus on the data center first, then you can start thinking more inside out, right? Yeah. Protecting those things and then moving outward. And so how are you, you know, what are you doing on your MPLS traffic or your remote users uh, or your guest networks, things like that. It really gives you that, that granularity you need to start fine tuning things. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, uh, the other feature that we added maybe, I don't know, seven or eight months ago is the best practice mode, right? What's that? So that's actually in the heat map as well to filter. Oh, okay. And so, you know, the heat map, it's right. If you have the default view is just, are you using it? Okay. Right. Yeah. Do you have a profile attached to a policy? Yeah. But what if that is an alert mode? That's not best practice. Right. That's IDS, not IPS. Exactly. Right? And so we we built a best practice mode where if you check it, it'll actually check all the profiles attached and make sure that they're passing best practice. Ah, okay. And so you, you might look like you're green in, let's say, threat, you know, like antivirus, but then when you hit that mode, you might go to like 20% or something. Yeah. So it might go to red. And it's because you're not actually configuring those profiles the right way. And oh. so that's a really good way to understand how secure you are, how strict you are. Yeah. Um, and then you can go back to the BPA side and look at the antivirus profile and actually can see exactly what, you know, profiles are being used and making sure that they're actually configured the right way. Does the BPA have a memory? Like, is there a way to compare one report to the next or, or see progression or improvement over time? Yeah, yeah, oh. so there is a trending view, right? And so we don't, um, we, so there is a memory because we store some aggregate data mm -hmm. for, for trending is one of the things, ah. um, but it's at the overall level, okay. right? We don't give the ability to drill down because if to do that, and I think we, we show eight of the previous, so it's the current plus ah. eight previous BPAs, you can uh -huh. see if you've improved. Um, but we don't we don't give you the ability to drill down into zones and things like that because we literally have to store Every. eight versions of the data and then the file would just get massive. Yeah. And so we only show that high level trending view, okay. which that's is, is usually pretty good enough, right? Uh -huh. um, and then the exec summaries, you know, that really kind of elevates the conversation, right, to the CISO level and more the director and executive level and the customers. Um, and it helps us have conversation with insurance providers and, and others, right? So yeah. it, it really is a, is a good way for a CISO to communicate to the CIO or to the board, hey, here's what we're doing. Um, and it kind of, I don't know, pretties it up a little bit, right? Well, so something you said there, especially earlier, uh, it sounds like the report's kind of a, a two-part, one's meant for executives, leadership, the other's meant for the, the engineers, the hardcore guys that mm -hmm. are going to be Devils in the details. Yep, yep. And and now in, in customer support portal, you can actually print the executive summary as a separate report. Oh, so just it if you want. Yep, and it just prints as a PDF and it's just, yeah. So tell us a little bit about what you see as the future for the best practice. Analyze. Is it analyzer? Assessment. Assessment. Okay. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's a lot of use cases where um, we've had a lot of large customers who have their own DevOps teams ah. and they we're not the only security vendor, right, that they're using. And so um, they build these dashboards for the CISO to get all of this data into one dashboard so the CISO understands, you know, how things are configured and things like that. And so, and they also have firewall standards that they set, 
right? So anytime you, you know, install a new Palo Alto Networks device, it has to meet these standards and they're using the BPA as their, as their standards. Yeah, and there's certain checks and things that they include. Um, but there's also cases where we have best practices that customers say that's not relevant to me, right? Mm, and so like so, the ability to snooze. Yeah, it's something like that, that's right? Cool. And so we, we're not gonna do that in the report itself because it's it's an HTML report. There's no persistence behind it. You can't like make changes, save it, and then send it to someone else. That's a good point. Right? It, it's, it's just a, it's, it's a interactive PDF. Like you can't make changes in the PDF and save it, right? right. Um, and so there's no persistence. So you can't dismiss things and they don't want their percentages to look bad, right? And so I said, I get where you're coming from, but um, I, I don't necessarily agree, but <laughs> sure. Um, and so um, what we're, we're gonna do is we're, we've had actually an API developed. If customers, as customers are making changes, like I said earlier, they can automatically kick off a best practice assessment and it'll be a cloud delivery API so that we, you know, we'll always have the up-to-date information because we're adding new changes and new right. new PanOS versions. Yes, yeah, so nine we're adding over thirty-five new best practices wow. uh, checks in there for nine point zero features, um, and so making sure that whatever version you're on, it, it can support that. And I think we we do support seven zero and higher. Oh, okay. Um, That's good to know. Ho actually. Hopefully, customers aren't still back there, but and they're starting to upgrade. But yeah. um, hopefully, at least on seven one. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, so, so if you want to automate BPAs and, and run them, you know, as frequently as you want in an automated, in a programmable way, you can do that. And then all you, instead of getting the HTML report, you'll actually get the raw JSON, right? Oh. So you'll just get the raw data. And so then, then you, you can, can parse that data and do whatever you want with it. So right. if you want to visualize it, throw it into Splunk, build a dashboard, whatever you want to do, you can do that. Um, yeah, and then there's other cases for like some of our service provider customers, like MSSPs who are supporting multiple customers and they want to automate these these things, they can leverage something like that as well. Has anyone ever been disappointed by or upset with the, the outcome from a BPA? Like maybe they were just not doing their job right and uh, yeah, so it funny, highlighted it. So there is an example, a story, and this was early on, this was before BPA, this was just the heat map. Okay. And we run it for a customer, um, I won't say who, <laughs> um, <laughs> but, uh, uh, we run it and we met with the director of security and we showed him and it was all red. And he said, this is wrong. And we're like, oh, like this is, this is, this is right. This is what we're seeing. And turns out they hired a new engineer who didn't know what they were doing and they disabled all these things. And they were basically flying, you know, wide open for about a month and a half and they had no idea. Wow. Um, well, that, that just shows how valuable the BPA is. It, it is. And it's not about pointing fingers right right and, and and so you know when we're communicating the bpa to customers it's like that it's like no this is free this is none of our competitors do this i didn't know and, and and if they did they would probably charge you an arm and a leg for it yeah um knowing my previous company they would have <laughs> um and so we made it a point to make this free it's like no you're paying for our platform we want to make sure you're getting the most value and we want to make sure that you're confident that you're protecting your organization and so, um, yeah, so I, I, there hasn't really been any negative things, I would say. Um, I think, you know, engineers particularly appreciate it because it validates it, right? Yeah. Or even, um, I, I think in some cases, maybe on a partner side, before the BPA, so maybe they did a deployment and then they come back in and run a BPA and then everything looks bad. That could look bad for that partner. But right. now we're saying, hey, partners, use this, right? So in the beginning, run it get a baseline, say, here's where you started, and then at the end, here's where they end it, and you can show that progress. That's huge. Right, yeah, and, it, and it's it's a tangible, it's objective, um, and it's not something the partner put together, it's something it's that from we, the vendor. It's from the vendor, yeah, exactly. So, uh, yeah, so I haven't heard any negative um, side of it, but, uh, but some people, you know, they found bugs and things like that, which is bound to happen, um, but, um, you know, we fix those quickly, and yeah, so. That's awesome that, you know, I, I uh, not having been around for a lot of the, the leadership discussions and having no visibility into why we, we even built the customer success team other than, as you said, we, we wanted to help our customers, but it's more than lip service. I mean, the fact that the BPA is free, the fact that you and your entire team work basically for free for, I mean, you don't, you get a salary, but um, <laughs> <laughs> you work to, to give away a free product and there's no um, side benefit. This isn't like Google Maps, you know, where, where we get 
you know, navigational data and stuff like that. It's it's just meant to, as you said, give customers confidence and direction yeah. and mm -hmm. and help them, you know, know that they're doing things with our suggested best practices. Yep. Um, and we're not sharing their data. Like we use right. the data primarily to understand how customers are using our product. So it's internal, right? We're using for product management to understand how product we're actually using the features. And we do it in aggregate, right? And right. for industry benchmarking, how do you compare against your industry peers, things like that. But yeah, no, it's 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 totally a genuine um, thing. And, and it, it's it's really awesome because um, you know, we do live by the mission of the company and our team feels like what we're doing matters, right? Like we're helping customers protect their organizations. In very and, tangible ways. In very tangible ways. Like the BPA does that, like, and, and it's, it's, it's awesome. Uh, so everyone feels really passionate about what we're doing. And even people who don't even come from a security background, they, they get it, right? And so, yeah, so it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, so what would you like to, final words, what would you like everyone to know? Or if you have a call to action, what would it be? Um, I, I honestly, I think um, now that customers have access to this in the customer support portal, they should be doing this as frequently as possible, right? Because things are changing so fast um, that you want to ensure that you're actually protecting your organization. And if you don't have the data to do that, you're going to be flying blind, right? And so definitely leverage that, use it as a tool um, in your tool chest. Maybe you have monthly reviews or quarterly, whatever, at a minimum, do it quarterly. Um, but, you know, anytime you guys do a, a commit, run it, right? Um, just to validate that you're actually doing things the right way. So That's awesome. And, and you guys don't have like a release schedule. It's just con because it's a cloud service. It's we, release, we do releases every two weeks. Every yeah. two weeks. Okay. So, yeah. So we, uh, we do minor version releases every two weeks. And then uh, we do hot fixes here and there. If there's a bug or something that we need to push a fix right away. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's usually a two-week cadence, yeah. So that, that, and that, I think, is why you suggest they just run it as often as possible because some people might say, well, I'm going to wait till the next release of Pan OS and then I'll rerun it again, but so much may have happened since then. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we're adding new features. We're getting feedback. Um, yeah, exactly. Or um, it could be, you know, new logic that we'd never heard of oh. or, hey, we didn't, we didn't have, we don't have a best practice for this feature yet. Um, let's add one, right? So we, we are constantly doing that. So, yeah. Well, thank you so much. I yeah, really appreciate no you taking the time to speak with us today. Awesome. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Nate. Yeah. Hey, that was a great interview that you had there with Nate. I have a couple of questions for you. What was the uh, what was uh, one or two at most takeaways for you from that interview? You know, I, I think Nate really highlighted so many great things, but the two things that stand out to me is run it often. And I can't remember the other one. Well, th that actually was one that I was going to share. I was going to say that the fact that oh. he recommended running it with every commit. Yes. Now, what we want to do is we want to bring in our good friend Tacoma Bob and have a segment um, <clears throat> that Mitch is calling Bob's Breaches. Hey, Bob. We wanted to bring you in here because the last year, 2017, now we're filming this in January no, 2017. Oh my gosh, 2019. <laughs> we film. We film. We're filming this in January of 2019. So, like doing a looking looking back for the past year, there's been a lot of breaches, and you have written uh, a regular blog post for our team as well as um, you you go to various conferences. So, in fact, tell us about the last conference uh, you went to. You went to where'd you go? Black Con or Black Hat and Def Con. Black Hat and Def Con. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Black Hat and Def Con. I, was I like Black Con because it just combines them all together. And yeah, I was I just volunteer at the Black Hat booth and then I go to Def Con after that. So, but then a big thing at Def Con is just to find Def Con parties. So. That's why you have all those flashy name badges behind your. Yeah, I've got. Yeah, the big thing lately at Def Con, especially, is the badges. So. Now, do you have to make your own or? No, you, they, you, you can buy them. You also get them as a ticket for when you enter DEF CON. Oh, that's awesome. I like that. That's the you, from you Super Mario. It how to connect things. Is that a skull? What is that? This no, is, that's one of the ghosts or squids. Squid thing, yeah. Anyway, so badge life is a big thing there. So everybody's wearing tons of those badges everywhere. And then you can program them and everything else. You and I were at a conference together uh, last year as well. And we sumo wrestled. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah, yeah. Broke your neck.
what I wanted to do is have a little bit of a, a challenge with you and Mitch. Have the two of you do kind of a malware trivia wrestling match. So I'm going to share my screen so you can see what I'm talking uh, about. You know, I'm going to be honest. Bob is going to kick my breeches on this. Yeah, thing. I don't know about that. You will. Oh, look at that. So this is a picture of you and me sumo wrestling just before I think I um, – I dodge out of the way and you fall down and then I yeah, that's exactly pile right. drive. <laughs> one of us was injured. The other one wasn't. I was asleep. <laughs> that's true. Yes, I did have some physical therapy after this event. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So I'm calling this the great malware trivia wrestling showdown contest quiz competition contest. You need some more words, and I think we should fit contest in there one more time. I think so. So we'll start with this first question here, and what we'll do is we'll alternate. So we'll start with uh, Mitch on this one. I know oh, this you, one. You know this one? Okay, we'll start with Mitch, see how he does with this one. What technology did the largest DDoS attack, 1.7 terabytes or terabits per second, Used to amplify its attack. Do they use Memcache, Samba, Dynamic DNS, or Heartblade? Well, I, I'm fairly certain it used DNS queries in a DNS reflection attack, but I wasn't sure about the dynamic part. So Bob's telling me it's probably Memcache. Well, first of all, it's not Memcache. It's Memcache D. There's a D on the end. That's oh. how you pronounce it. It's Memcache D. Okay, so that was the answer then? Yeah, so an amplification on DDoS with DNS gets you about five or seven times amplification. The amplification with Memcache is about fifty to seventy thousand times. Oh my gosh! So it's a wow. whole other. So ball basically, you're saying my answer is wrong, fifty to seventy thousand times, but you got the right answer. Well done. Your answer is wrong because this in a D, <laughs> and Mitch got it wrong because he guessed the wrong amplification amount. <laughs> hey, I knew it involved DNS. Give me a little bit. It's not DNS. Oh, Anyways. really? Okay, so no. the Krebs attack used DNS, didn't it? Uh, I want to say... I thought that was 600 gigabits a second. I forget on that one. I'm, I want I want to say it was Memcache, but I could be wrong. Memcache D. Uh -huh. but, I knew it was Mirai involved. But. but that hit GitHub, and GitHub was 1.7 for sure. And I think Krebs was in on that one too. But All right, next question. According to Minerva Labs, Wait, who who's created... This? Who's this one too? The, well, let me finish reading this. I'll, uh -huh. According to Minerva Labs, who created the banking trojan named Pegasus? So we'll give this one to Bob here. Pegasus. Fancy Bear, Boo Trap. That's it. If I remember right, that's the iOS trojan that was modular, right? And they could add pieces onto it, if I recall. I want to say it was Fancy Bear then, but I could be wrong on that one. Oh, I think you're close. You're wrong. Ah. It's boo trap. Ah, I don't know. <clears throat> but I did know that Pegasus was, so. <laughs> That's true. That's true. So, yeah, it's iOS <clears throat> and uh, other phones. So let me let me look at this here. This is from, um, I'll read this here. Uh, That's not the one here. I was thinking of. Yeah, I was told they told that, that one off. <clears throat> Once on a victim computer, the initial module, installer EXE, uses process hollowing to inject co code into service host. And after the main module is initialized, Pegasus launches several parallel processes. So it does domain replication, it does mail slot listening, it uses a pipe server listener to discover and communicate uh, and create other copies of Pegasus on the same network. It tries every few minutes to dump cr credentials from memory using Mimikatz. Yeah, Mimikatz, yeah. And then network connectivity, it um, interfaces with the CNC server and periodically exchanges messages. Anyways, it's, it's a Windows system type of attack. Okay. It doesn't say anything about SMB and uh, Eternal Blue, does it? Um, not in my... Yeah, so it's not a it's, Well, yeah, but that's a big one that even a lot of people use that. But, uh, okay. yeah, it, it spreads a different fashion, so that's cool. All right, next one. All right. Now, this is from last year, but the, it says 2015. So the article was last year. So in 2015, how did the attack against Ukraine's power grid get started? What are the options? Oh, there are none. 
Well, there was banking software uh, or tax software, I think, how they originally put it out. And then um, they didn't anticipate there being folks outside of the Ukraine that would also download and use the tax software. So it spread beyond their intended boundaries, as I recall, unless I completely botched it. Well, that might have been the, the more recent one. I'm thinking of not pet you there. That was the. Oh, you're right. Docs. Yeah, yeah, that's not pet you. So, what do you think, Bob? Uh, I know the guy who fixed it. That was Yasinski. And I know it was called Dark Energy. And how right. did it get started? This is from the Wired. Uh, there's a Wired magazine article that went through and outlined the attack because two years later they did the attack again. Wait. So this is the one where they went into the, uh, they had a bunch of these smart switches where they could remotely control the, the substations and turn different breakers on and off. And they yeah. turned a bunch of them off and even shut down the network that took them to it. So the only way to get the power back was to visit the substation and manually cycle it on, right? Yeah, and there's yeah. video of the, of, the, of the guys actually turning off the sections of the power grid. You can find it out there on the internet. But as far as how did it get started, Oof. yeah, it's how most attacks get started today. Phishing, oh. phishing. Okay, it was a phishing email that was pre that was sent pretending to be from the Ukrainian parliament. Oh, that rings a bell now. Yeah, yeah, that's the that's the the group that found it was ISSP, based out of Ukraine, in Kiev, and the guy's <laughs> name is Alexei Yasinski. Okay, a... Mitch, I got one for you. Okay, you go. I'm probably gonna buy it. <clears throat> what country experienced the world's very first cyber attack and when? France in 1834, Switzerland in 1891, the United States in 1982, and the United States in 1988. Ah, I'm going to botch this, but it's not in the 1800s, I can say. Well, cyber attack, I mean, if we go off of computers, then there's no way it's in the 1800s. So. That leads me to the United States, and I think 82 was a bit too early, so I'm going to vote 88. 88. So that was actually the Morris worm, or internet yes. worm. So that's uh, November 2nd, 1988. However, that is not the right <laughs> answer. How, how was it a cyber attack then when there was no internet? Well, it has to do, exactly, it has to do with communications. So... Uh, networks, right? So back oh, in the yeah. 1800s, the very first network. I'm sorry, Bob, I didn't give you a chance to answer that one. <clears throat> no, no, go ahead. I, 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 I remember it now. So this is the first national data network uh, that was created in France, and it, it was basically using semaphore and these towers and a, and a telegraph system using semaphore to basically transmit financial information. And a couple of these... Um, brothers, these two bankers, um, actually hijacked it <clears throat> and paid off one of the towers, basically, so they could get inside information. That's and so they right. consider that the very first cyber attack. Interesting. All right. So, Bob, I got one here for you. Shoot. The next one, what piece of malware use CPU temps to evade analysis? CPU temperatures. That's, well... Gravity Rat used CPN fan speeds. Ah, that's it. Gravity yeah, okay. Rat. Yeah, so the deal is, do you want, you want to hear a quick explanation? Yeah, yeah, yeah please. Yeah, so the deal is these, uh, these malware people find ways to evade analysis, meaning they see if they're in a sandbox. So uh, they look for linear mouse movements that are too linear, for example, because that makes it, you know, computers faking them out. One way to tell if they're running on real hardware is to look at, at a piece of hardware that, don't exist in a VM, i.e. a fan speed. So that's how Gravity Rat, if it, if it didn't find a fan, then it would just bail out and leave because it wants to run, but it has to hide. As soon as it runs, it exposes itself. So I thought that was a cool one. Yeah, yeah. I think it's also cool that uh, Wildfire was still able to detect this. Yeah, they got all kinds of tricks, man. They, they throw uh, fake mouse movements in, they do different screen sizes, they spin time back and forth. Yeah, it's, it's good stuff. So one thing I realized is I'm really keeping score here, so I hope you guys don't mind. Bob's been winning. I don't know. Okay, so here, <laughs> here's a winner. Thing. We're all winners together. You're so humble. <laughs> what type of devices did the VPN filter? Attack? Home routers. Home routers. <laughs> Home routers. Home routers. Microtech okay. ones were some of the biggest, but then there was a bunch of Linksys, um, and then Netgear, and I think a D-Link router too. Zizel near the end. 
or at least yeah. yeah there was a lot and then the and fbi was, came out and said hey everybody reboot your routers <laughs> right which made very little sense to me initially but it, it kind of makes sense that when the the malicious code was only running in memory and when you reboot it it had to flush that and then uh get reinfected and then rejoin the command and control server so that reinfection rejoin was how they were able to to track it did you hear did you know if it ever was used in the real world i can tell you can yeah you go ahead yeah so uh it actually was there was an attack placed on the ukrainian uh, it's always it's always the ukraine right so, right i was gonna say it doesn't pay to live in the ukraine literally. yeah so it's the ukrainian water plant with they wow. tried to open up the uh uh chemical, okay. the, the chemicals and dump extra chemicals into the water and so that's but they they caught it before it actually did its thing but that was what it was trying to do but they were trying to kill people i don't know if it'd kill people it would have ruined their water plant <laughs> you know oh like Pouring Gatorade on your your crops, you know, extra electrolytes, well, extra bleach or something, you know. I don't know. Oh, gosh. Yeah, VPN filter filter is a good one though because it's modular and stuff. But oh. all right, well, that is all of my questions that I have for you guys. So uh, well done, Bob. Just won that round. <laughs> this just shows that I'm no good at trivia. <laughs> Bob's pretty good with malware. He's also really good at sumo wrestling. One of the things that uh, came out in an earlier conversation, Bob, is that you and I were talking about how how sometimes we, we you know we visit a lot of customer sites and customers are not always aware of the different types of attacks or even what a command and control server is or what a domain um, generating algorithm is and that kind of thing. So, just for for the sake of our customers out there. What are some of the ways that you follow the news and consume news so that you know you're aware of what the enemy's doing? Right? There's that old adage in, in terms of war and combat that the more you know, right, uh, the better you are, and you want to know your enemy, that kind of thing. So how do you know your your enemy, there, Bob? So I agree with you. Knowing your enemy is huge, and knowing what's happening is huge. And I don't think people give that enough credit, right? Like, do you know how many how much malware uses? What percentage of malware uses DNS? Most of it. Give me a percent. Just take a guess. I would go ninety-eight percent. Cisco year and a half ago, so it's ninety-one point three percent of all malware uses DNS. So, point being, if you don't know what a DGA is, and you don't know how these other techniques work, then you're not right. going to think, "Oh, I need to turn on such and such in a firewall in order to defend yourself from DNS," which right. then defends you from, from the malware. So, hey, Bob, can you pretend I don't know what a DGA is? I can, but I would like to have a slide of my Britney Spears. <laughs> yes, right. Well, I can actually show that. I can show the Britney Spears. So if you want to talk about it, I'll put it up on the screen when I do the post it. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, so Turla Group. So, for for example, a DGA is dy dynamic domain, domain generating algorithm. There you go, domain generation algorithm. And what that is is a way that, that malware, ins instead of going directly to an IP address or getting only stuck on one domain, they can avoid these techniques that block these things, blacklists, what, what have you. Here's a picture of Britney Spears, right? Britney's Turla Group actually used Britney Spears Forum as a way to perform a manual domain generation algorithm. Huh. You can see down here in the forum, there's a secret code that this guy typed in, and the malware and all these infected computers throughout the world would get, once in a while go and check this uh, Britney Spears site and do nothing. Sit there and just try and try and try until one day the guy says, okay, cool, I'm going to fire these things off. And when he types in this code, as you can see on this slide here, uh, it actually adds those di those letters to the back of a bit.ly domain. So bit.ly is a way to create a shortcut to right. a URL. Uh, so that way, if somebody pins that one down and blacklists that site, that, that would lead them to some infected exploit kit or something. Then all he has to do is go into the Britney Spears forum and type new code and got a new domain. Ah, so I was actually thinking that the domain generation algorithms, you know, just based on the name was more like the RSA token codes where you'd have a command and control server that's got a seed uh, value and it's rotating, you know, just like the token codes do. And you'd have a, a piece of malware that's doing the same thing. And so at the exact same time, they would both generate an equivalent domain one to host on and one to talk to, uh, but it sounds like it's, it's very different than that. Well, I mean, there's probably, they probably could do that as well, but the, the primary use is, is that way, 
if something gets blacklisted, they send them off to a different domain, right? So that's right. a manual DGA. Now, an automatic DGA, if you look at there's great articles on Game Over Zeus. So the malware would sit there on a workstation, and it would try to go to websites, these random websites, based on an algorithm. So it's a mathematical algorithm based on time or some other seed, right? Yep. And the bad guy has the same algorithm sitting on his computer at home, and he can sit there and watch which domains are going to hit when. So expand that a little further. So these infected clients, they go out to a thousand different domains a day, all random letters, right? And then then this this bad guy knows in two months they're going to hit abcfgt.com. So right before the day that, it, that these infected computers reach out to that, he simply registers a domain, puts up the exploit kit, redirects it to wherever he wants, and boom. So how do you stop that? Well, it sounds like you'd chase your tail with a bunch of the ones that the algorithm tries to reach out to, and really you just got to be in the mind of the attacker to know which one he's going to register when. Yeah, which you can't unless you can reverse engineer the domain generation algorithm. Yeah, still the seed value like they did with RSA's token codes back in the day. Yeah, so so that's the problem is you have to have some sort of D, DGA. Can you back end into it? Like if you capture enough domains that get queried for, is there a way that you can potentially guess what the next subsequent values might be? No, I, I suppose it depends on the seed or the code or, but you know, this, this gets into these guys. We got unit 42 guys and these uh, that, that can handle that sort of stuff. But yeah. Well, a preview. Go ahead. A, a preview for an upcoming episode. Uh, we're going to talk to Martin Walter He's the product manager over the new, a new DNS service oh. that Palo Alto Networks is providing. And it may or may not, tune in, include some, some prevention capabilities along the lines that you're talking about. So there's actually an article put up by Unit 42. It's a couple years old now. Knowing your domains before you do. Ah. And what it is, they use different uh, algorithms to look at the entropy within the domain name, the randomness in a domain name. So then the malware guys go, well, okay, well, we'll just put real words in there and make it look realer than it is. All right. right. It's, yeah, so it's this constant battle. But I, I love that stuff. So. Wow. so to go back, so Game Over Zeus was doing this thousand, these infected units would reach out to a thousand different domains a day. And the good guys, the FBI and some other folks, figured out the algorithm. So what they did is they pre-registered three months of domains. Oh, so this malware is reaching out for command and control, expecting to be able to hit something, but the ba the good guys registered all the domains, so the bad guy couldn't jump in. Oh, so that's fantastic! So they three months. They conscripted their own bots, essentially. No, they just they plugged up the domains that the bad guy couldn't. It was register. like a denial of service against the uh, attack. Registration, yeah. It's genius. So. so. So Bob, hey. Thanks so much for sharing your breaches. Yeah. <laughs> Showing us your breaches. I'll share my Showing breaches us. Anytime you want me to. All right. Thanks, talk Bob. to you guys later. Bye. All right, Jason. That was that was so enlightening. Um, I, I learned a ton. And now it's our opportunity to share what else we've learned this week. So I want to share with you a story uh, from last week. Apparently, the FBI and several law enforcement agencies took down the domains and sites for this uh, XDedic. Uh, XDedic is a portal where attackers would go in and they would buy time on servers that had been compromised. So there was about $68 million in fraudulent purchases made through this system of the service XDedic over the past several years. And the victims of XDedic include like law firms, accounting firms, pension funds, local and state and federal government entities, hospitals, and even emergency services like, you know, 911 and so oh, on. Interesting. And the security researchers who've been tracking the website for years have previously described it as one of the largest underground marketplaces, especially for hacked servers. So it's kind of interesting. They built for themselves like an app store of compromised systems that you could go pay as little as $6 and gain control over these servers. And part of its services, Xdetic offered sellers technical support, you know, tools for patching hacked servers. So if your server was compromised, they would keep it up to date for you just to keep it online and doing all of their malicious deeds. 
So they were taken down last week, and I, I, it's interesting, you know, the business around cybercrime, and, you know, thankfully, they were taken down. So, Mitch, do you know today is a holiday? Today? Today is a holiday. So it's, we're recording this on January 28th. I don't normally like to, you know, mention the days we're doing this, just to um, keep things fresh, but today is January 28th. Today is a holiday. It's an international holiday. It's been a holiday in the United States since 2009, and it is International Privacy Day. So did you know that there's a holiday dedicated to raising people's awareness about their cybersecurity? It's called International Privacy Day, and so today, this very day, is a day where all around the world, people are lighting candles to the personal identifiable information. So um, I don't have a candle here. Maybe I should get a candle. We should raise candles. Let's raise yeah. our drinks. Raise our drinks. Cheers, my friend. You know, I saw a bunch of stuff today on privacy, and I, I'll be honest, I never realized why. So <laughs> it's a holiday. Thank you so much for so, sharing. It's a holiday. <laughs> we, 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 we can, so next year, this time, we should have uh, a privacy Ooh, day prize. or yeah. some sort of new yeah. tradition or something like that. I had no idea. To your privacy, my friend. GDPR. It's yours too. Hey, my friends, thank you so much for hanging in there with us and watching this. Uh, we had a lot of fun uh, recording this. We had a great uh, conversations with Tacoma Bob and Nate, and I hope you guys enjoyed those conversations as much as we did. And we are looking forward to our upcoming episodes because we're going to be talking about the new features in PanOS 9.0. We have some great interviews uh, around threat prevention and with uh, Unit 42, so some fun stuff coming up as well. Now, please don't take the opportunity to click the links down below where you can see the episode timeline. You can uh, take any labs that may be associated with these episodes that we produce and give us some feedback. Let us know what you liked, didn't like, things we could do to make it more interesting for you. We are all ears, as they say. Until next time, my friends, stay secure. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>